Can you hear me? How many of you remember to make your bed after Sister Twainim's Dhamma talk? You already remember to do it? I, I went back and checked to make sure I made my bed. <laughs> so we'll start by listening to Three Sounds of the Bell and fully enjoy this present moment. It's a... Uh, for some of us, the uh, last few hours that we're here in Deer Park, in the Hidden Valley, and uh, we've made the deep bonds with uh, the friends in our family, in our Dhamma sharing family, in our, uh, maybe with our children, And it's a, a moment to touch the seed of gratitude in our heart for all of the conditions that have come together to produce this uh, feeling of togetherness. So as we listen to the sound of the bell, we can nurture our gratitude as we are aware of our breathing. We still are alive. And it's a wonder to be alive. So dear, respected Thai, dear, dear noble parents, dear noble friends, dear noble Sangha, we've had a festival of the Dhamma these past few days. And uh, I've felt so much joy sitting in uh, my Dhamma sharing family, the willow tree family, we sat the, down in the campground, so surrounded by tents, and watching the children go up and down the road, the teens. It's been more than two years since we could have the children here. And I think I speak for my brothers and sisters when I say that uh, the seeing the kids running around, climbing trees, <laughs> going into the bushes, looking in the telescope, running around the soccer field, it brings so much joy. The monks and nuns, we are like the uncles and aunties <laughs> of all of the children. And in, Viet in Vietnamese culture, actually, we say uh, go or bak. <laughs> you know, even if it's not really our aunt or uncle, I mean, I'm not Vietnamese, but in, in Vietnamese culture, even if that person is not our uncle or our auntie, they are like an honorary aunt or 
uncle. And the monks and nuns, we, we love to play that role, to just, uh, as one parent in uh, my sharing group said, I watched the monk and he shared with my, my son. I've told him that many times, but he came up to me and he told me, Daddy, do you know about this? <laughs> I, and I just smiled, I didn't say anything. Yeah. I, I, I remembered all the times I told him that, he didn't listen to me. But somehow, when the monk told him, <laughs> he could get excited about that, about mindful breathing, about stopping. Today, uh, we have Sister Uyenim on the, the bell. <laughs> You know, in, in 2005, our teacher went back to Vietnam. And that was the first time I ever went to Asia. And everything was so new and so exciting. And we had undercover policemen behind us, you know, following us everywhere in Vietnam. And... Uh, it brought so much joy and, and uh, excitement to, especially the young people in Vietnam and the young monastics. And so Thai offered a retreat for monks and nuns in Huang Pha Temple, in, which means uh, the temple for teaching the Dhamma in many all around. And uh, I remember I was just, an, I was the novice so I was one of the youngest monks on the trip. And in my, my monastic sharing group was Sister Uyen Niem. And I don't know if she remembers. But, um, and I remember when she shared about how she had to go out of her temple <laughs> and take many trains and find people to help her so that she could make it there to Wang Fap Temple. So she would have a chance to meet Thai and the Sangha. I felt so um, kind of humbled <laughs> and inspired that someone would take, go through so much danger and take so much risk <laughs> to be able to follow their aspiration, to really uh, uh, walk on the path of awakening. And I always remember that story of my, my younger sister. <laughs> And how she uh, she felt inspired to yeah to to join a kind of community where she could really live her her, her aspiration as a nun. There's a calligraphy of Thai, our teacher, that I want to share with you. So I'm going to write it in Vietnamese and then translate it. And I checked with my elder brother to make sure I spell it correctly. Đã có, đừng đi rồi. Con không còn lò sơ. I remember that uh, this calligraphy was in the Dhamma Nectar Hall 
of Lower Hamlet in Plum Village when I was a novice. And that was before we built the new um, Assembly of Stars meditation hall. I think it was one of the first big new halls that they built in Plum Village. And so at that time I, I didn't know almost any Vietnamese. And I remember sitting there in formal lunch many times and looking at this calligraphy <laughs> and trying to understand what does it mean. So it actually took me quite a while because I, I didn't ask anyone. So Dung means uh, the path or the, the road or the, the, the way. <laughs> and Ga means you have, so it means to have a path. Um, it's a great honor and a privilege and a gift to have a path. Many of us don't have a path and that's why we feel so lost and fearful. <laughs> that's why we have so much anxiety. We can remember when we are um, just a, a child and we maybe lose our mom. For me it happened when I was at the, um, what do you call it, like the, the, the county fair. I grew up in Connecticut and there was a, every year at the Catholic church in town they had a, like a big uh, fair with Ferris wheels and sometimes people brought animals and there are many things you could buy, cotton candy, popcorn. And I remember that somehow in all the people I lost my mom. I was maybe six, seven years old. And actually I have a reputation in my family for getting, not getting lost, but purposefully getting lost <laughs> and actually enjoying myself very much. <laughs> but making my mom, when I would meet my mom again, she'd be crying and oh, so, so afraid. <laughs> but I also remember trying to, that time, feeling anxious because I wanted to um, find my mom and I met uh, this uh, it was a teenage girl so I was maybe I was seven or eight I can't remember exactly and and she came up I was by myself as a seven eight year old and she came up to me and she said oh you're so cute <laughs> And I remember being so confused because um, I was a, a young boy and I, I never had a woman, like for me she was a very uh, attractive <laughs> older woman. <laughs> and that, that had never happened to me before. Nobody had come up to me and say, oh, you know, you're so cute. And, you know, I had just been experiencing in elementary school um, the whole thing about girlfriends and oh are you are you is she your girlfriend <laughs> you know this is like fourth grade fifth grade <laughs> and then people tease you because they see you together on the playground and that's that's all you're just together on the playground and then she's your girlfriend yeah. and I remember being so like confused inside of myself when she said that. I, I didn't know what to feel. Actually, as an adult, of course, I see she was just a teenage girl seeing a cute little boy. But for me, as a as a the little boy, I felt very mixed up inside. <laughs> so actually, I had some anxiety, and I remember after that, wanting going around and singing because. I had experienced these emotions that I'd never experienced before. So I wanted, of course, to find my mommy. <laughs> right? My mom is a refuge. And I saw that happen with many of the children this week. When they get confused, when they, there's too much chaos, like especially when Brother Fab Jung creates too much chaos. 
<laughs> then maybe they run back to mom. <laughs> okay, but for Pyung, it's too much. Too much chaos. I need to find mommy. <laughs> and uh, so I, I felt in those moments like I didn't have it. I lost my way. I'm lost. Which way to go? I want to go back and find my mom. And uh, as I grew older, I felt more bold. And sometimes I would go with my, my best friend and walk in the forest. And one day we walked for many, many, many hours. And, and I felt at peace because uh, I, knew, I knew the land. I knew where home was. And I knew even though I was many miles away from home, I knew how to get home. I knew the path, home. And uh, when my, my friend Dave and I, when we came walking back, on, we came to my road, and we must have been gone for three or four hours. And my mom came driving up in the car, and she was hysterical and crying. And, and I became so frightened. Actually, we were not frightened at all about being lost, because we had a path. But when my mom came and she was crying, and then I felt some fear. I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but I didn't feel fear because I knew my way home. I knew how to get home because I understood the geography around my house had become part of my, my mind, the landscape of my mind. And I felt like I knew I could take one step, another step, in solidity, and find my way back home. And as I grew older, then of course my, my adventures became mm, wider and longer. <laughs> the trajectory expanded out into traveling around the country and then sometimes going to Europe, living on my own. But I felt like it was all just an extension of this sense of, okay, I know the path home. And uh, I can go wider and farther without any fear. So this calligraphy, da, da, ka, dung, di, roi. So I already, this means I already have a path to go on, and dry. It's not just any path, it's a path that we walk, Kondundi. And the second line is, so I, I don't have any fear or worry. This is uh, like worry and this is fear, la, so. And this is any more. I don't have it anymore because I have a path to walk on. When I encountered the Dhamma, it was at a point in my life when I had a big depression. I was about, I think, 24 years old. And I kept taking these trajectories, going farther and farther. <laughs> trying to test how far I could go and still find my way home. And, uh, and then I, I, I separated with my partner and um, I came back to the United States and I felt lost. I found my way home. Actually, at that point, my parents had gotten divorced and my mom was living in a new house in, a, in a, the town next to where I grew up. And so even the, the house was different. It wasn't home somehow. And I found that I couldn't be my, my mom's little boy anymore, <laughs> living in my mom's house. In her mind, I was just a little boy somehow that had left one to go to college eight years before. But uh, I knew that, uh, I saw that 
okay, this is very difficult. <laughs> That's, somehow that doesn't correspond to my experience anymore. And so this uh, combined situation, as well as going back to my hometown, going back to that land that I knew, the paths that I knew, and walking them by myself, I felt a kind of emptiness, kind of loss, like what happened to my happiness, my joy, <laughs> as a young boy walking these paths. I felt like everything was perfect in the world. I was going to school, I was doing well in school, I had lots of friends, and uh, where did they all go? <laughs> Many of them had moved out of the town. Some of them were married already. And uh, my town had become one of these towns where the parents move there when they have kids. They send their kids to the school, the public school. Pay very high property taxes. <laughs> and then as soon as the kids are out the door, they go to Florida or Southern California or something like that. Maybe Arizona. <laughs> so when I'd walk, I would walk around the town, my hometown. Sometimes I would uh, think of that Bruce Springsteen song, you know, this is my hometown. <laughs> With this kind of nostalgia right, in my heart. And I would say, where, where did my joy go? Where did my happiness go? And I remember once going to the, at the video store. Do you remember the video stores? <laughs> Whatever happened to video stores? We had a, like a, a video store in my town and one of my classmates was working there selling videos. I was like, oh, one person I know, still there. <laughs> there was the ice cream shop right next door where we used to go after soccer games or after a running meet, a cross-country meet. And even the family that owned it was one of my classmates uh, within her family owned that and they had sold it to another family. And I saw on the, uh, the walls of the ice cream shop all the pictures from our prom, from like the good old days. Here I am like 25 years old thinking about the good old days. Yeah, and so all of this, this uh, reminiscing and feeling of loss kind of pervaded my, con pervaded my consciousness. And so I desperately was looking for the path home. I was physically home, but somehow the physical home was not, didn't feel like a home anymore. It wasn't a, these kind of halcyon days of past that I remember. So I felt lost. I felt I didn't have a path. And I needed a path. I desperately needed a path to find my way home. So fortunately, um, I did find a path. I discovered the path of mindfulness, specifically the path of mindful breathing. So we learned uh, a little bit about mindful breathing in the guided meditations in the morning. We start with just being aware of our in and out breath. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. You listen to the sound of the bell. And enjoy your in and out breath.
who, who could keep their attention just only on their breath during the whole time of listening to the bell. Anyone? All right. <laughs> How many people got distracted once? Okay. How many people got distracted twice? Oh. So you got distracted and you came back to your breathing and then you got distracted again. How about three times? Okay, good. So I found it's very helpful to just recognize that. Sometimes we feel like we're not a good meditator if we cannot follow our in-breath continuously for one sound of the bell. But in my experience, the nature of the mind is to be distracted. It's uh, always looking for something new. Like when we are out in the bush hunting and we look and we see something that doesn't quite fit. It's just the backside of a deer through the foliage. And then we know, ah, the prey. <laughs> or we, we, we are foraging for fruit, something to eat, and we just notice a little bit of bright color under the tree, and that nose like, ah, there's a sweet cherry we can pick. So that tendency to want to find something new is very strong. And it's quite natural that our mind is always looking for something new. And it actually takes training to find that newness, that freshness in the breathing. But with time, the breath becomes more and more interesting. One of my elder brothers gave a talk once and said, I have a secret to confess. I have a lover. And we're all like, oh, oh my God. He's a, a venerable monk. He has a lover. He's admitting in front of the whole Sangha there are many hundreds of people there in Plum Village. And, and he said, I am in love with my breathing. And we're all like, oh. <laughs> we wanted to know who it was. And we're like, oh. <laughs> but I love, I've, I've shared that story many times actually. <laughs> because it reminds me of the beauty and the freshness of my breath that many times when I may think I'm being mindful of my breath I'm actually just mindful of my ghost breath in neuroscience we can talk about um, you know kind of phantom or ghost experiences for example many times when we we eat a tomato, we don't eat the tomato like we're first eating a tomato. We have our memory. As soon as we see the color of the tomato, we think, oh, this flavor, this uh, texture, this uh, amount of liquid. And so when we start eating the tomato, we're actually not eating a real tomato. We're just eating our perception that are already there of the tomato. Maybe the first instant of biting into the tomato, we, we have some direct sensation. But then as we continue to chew, we're not chewing a real tomato. We're just chewing a phantom tomato. So the same is true of all of our senses. So we have to be careful as meditation practitioners not to be mindful of our phantom breathing. Because <laughs> the phantom breath is very boring. Oh, it's just a breath. It goes in and out. It's normal. Let me think about something else. Something new, something exciting. Like, what's, what's he going to say next? But if we come back and no longer lose ourselves in that kind of ghost breath, but see directly what is going on with this breathing. Like, what, what is this doing? What does it feel like in my nose? 
What does it feel like in my trachea as it goes down, filling my lungs? All those capillaries in my lungs being nourished by the oxygen in the air. How does it feel to have that oxygen transported by my blood along my veins, my arteries, out to every cell in my body, producing, um, being consumed by the cells, generating with the sugars and the mitochondria, heat and energy so that I can live, digest my food, move my muscles. What does that feel like? So that is the invitation of this uh, retreat, to come back to the freshness of our breath, to see the beauty, to fall in love with our breath. And we start by breathing in and breathing out, just being aware of our breath. So in the mindful walking, we coordinate our breathing with our step. Our teacher went through a, a deep depression as well. He was a very popular Dhamma teacher in Vietnam. Many young people came to him. He was teaching uh, all kinds of things that monks don't usually talk about, like physics, quantum physics, and literature, and economy, and uh, so they really wanted to learn these things. They said, this monk, he's unlike any other monk I've, they'd ever heard before. And Tai had also uh, uh, had a chance to, to go to the West to study and to understand more about Western culture. And so many young people, they really wanted to learn from Tai. But inside, Tai felt very lost. He felt... Um, that the war in Vietnam, which was caused by so many forces outside of the control of the country, of the people there, he, did, he could not see an end to that war. But he wanted to give hope, to inspire the young people to, to act, to go out to villages, to help, to teach the children to build sanitary toilets, to bring medicine. But in his heart, he knew that for every step they took forward, sometimes they were put two steps back. And so in his, he felt a, a kind of despair coming on him. And he often said that despair is the worst thing that can happen to a human being. But fortunately, he discovered the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutra. And he said that day was the happiest day of his life <laughs> until that point. Because as a young monk in Vietnam, he didn't learn about mindful breathing, this simple practice of just being aware of the breath, this vital life energy which is coming in and out in every moment. Just learning to direct his awareness to the breathing and maintain it there over time suddenly allowed him to come out of the the abyss of his depression come back to life his thinking found no way out and yet somehow with mindful breathing there was a way he found a path So for me, as a, in that moment when I felt so lost in my life as a young man, um, I didn't know Thai story at that time. <laughs> and I, didn't, I hadn't heard of Thai. I hadn't read Thai's books, but I managed to come on this practice of mindfulness. And I had the f lived a physical experience of my body, like coming back online, coming back to life all of the circular thinking 
that had been going on for months of trying to find my home, trying to find my place of refuge in my hometown, in my old friends, in my family. It, had, it didn't work. But that moment of just sitting down and following my breathing, I came out of the abyss of my thinking back to the present moment. And I felt alive again. I felt like, what, what's going on? There were moments when I would go for long walks and I would have the kind of thoughts going over and over and over and over again in my head and I thought, I'll never get out of this, this cycle of thinking. Did you ever, ever have that? Yeah? You try to think your way out of the situation. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> and yet somehow, because we are trained to be rational, so we think that if we can just hammer out with reason our, our liberation, <laughs> our freedom, that it will somehow we'll feel better. But somehow it doesn't work. And so when we get that insight, we, we learn, okay, I need, to, I need a path. Because uh, it's not enough just to think. It's not about solving a problem. Maybe we're very good at math. And in school, I loved math, calculus, and making proofs. And I think, I, I can do that, but I can't. How do I learn to be happy? It's not enough. But suddenly, just with the simple act of being aware of my breath, I could come back to life. I could see the wonders of life again. And then I could start to embrace my suffering. The suffering of my parents' divorce. The suffering of um, hurt relationships. The suffering of my own actions, my own unskillful actions of speech, of thinking. In the this depression, I could not, I didn't have the capacity to do that. I just tried to find anything, maybe some food or a little bit of peace, a little bit of pleasure here and there, but nothing lasting. Everything goes very quickly and then I'm back in the same pit that I was in before. That's what it felt like. But suddenly I had a path and I didn't feel in that moment, any more fear. I knew I could walk this path. I knew I could not, um, I didn't know the way completely out of my suffering, but I could cross my legs, I could sit down, <laughs> I could follow my breathing. <laughs> I could see that very clearly. This I can do, okay. <laughs> I hadn't learned about mindful walking yet at that point, but I knew, okay, if I need to take Many years and just sit on a cushion and follow my breathing, I can do that. <laughs> and fortunately, in my generation at that time, there, was, uh, there were practice centers that I could come to. Suddenly I discovered there are Dharma centers. <laughs> there are places I can go to and I can sit on a cushion and just follow my breathing. And that's all. Nobody's going to try to uh, force me to believe something. No one's going to try to convert me. <laughs> I can just go there and follow my breath. And that's, that's okay. So that was a, such a great gift. Maybe we can listen to another sound of the bell. Just, now see if we can follow your breathing. So, uh, aware of the in and out breath. And it's like my finger is my, your, my attention. And the marker is my breathing. So see if you can keep your attention on the breath for the whole length of the in-breath and the whole length of the out-breath.
How about now? Who, who could keep their attention on their breathing the whole time? Hmm? Okay. <laughs> How about who got distracted once? Who got distracted twice? I got distracted twice. <laughs> At the beginning, I suddenly thought, how much time do I have left? <laughs> and then toward the end, I thought, what will I talk about next? <laughs> but each time, I came back to the breath. You see? So I have more compassion on myself. I used to get frustrated if I could not maintain my awareness of the breath for the whole time of breathing. But now I have more... Um, kind of kindness towards myself. I recognize it's the nature of the mind to be distracted. But I know that right away I, bring, I can bring my attention back to the breath. Gently. Without forcing it. I just guide it back. It's like when we're walking on a path and suddenly you end up in the bushes <laughs> when you're not paying attention to where you're walking. Did that ever happen to you? And you're just walking, and you're like, well, how did I end up over here in these bushes? <laughs> and you feel them kind of like against your face, and maybe you get a little cut on your head. And so that reminds you to go back onto the path. But when we have an obsession, when we are caught in desire, then we just keep barreling through <laughs> the bushes, <laughs> and we get cuts and scratches all over our <laughs> face and body. But... We, we, we just follow this kind of, it's like a um, high-speed train of our mind, of our thinking. I remember there was a, a, a man who came to Plum Village when I was a young monk, and he, he was from Holland, and um, he really loved the practice. But sometimes, like I recognize in myself, his way of practicing, mindful walking, I could see in his mind he was like one of those trains. <laughs> like you could not stand in front of him because <laughs> even he's going very slow, but <laughs> the, 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 the control was so strong. It's kind of tight. And uh, so there's something not very uh, light and free about his way of practicing walking meditation. And I recognize that in myself. There's some part of me that's like that. So I try to look at Thai and see the lightness, the, the freedom that Thai has when he practices walking. Thai's energy is very free, and he enjoys the trees. Sometimes he puts his hand against the tree. <laughs> so I practice to do that too during walking meditation. Sometimes he just stops and enjoys the sound of the bird. So we're not too tight. The Buddha um, once gave a teaching to a monk who had been a musician. He played a kind of like a lyre or something like that, stringed instrument. And that monk was having a lot of difficulty on his path. And he told that monk, if, if, if I tighten the string on the instrument too tight, Will it sound uh, good? And he said, no, no, it will sound very tense. You might even break the string. And the Buddha said, well, what if I turn it too loose? Will it, will it sound good? And he said, no, no, no. <laughs> if it's too loose, it, it will just flap around. It won't make any noise. So you have to tune it just right. <laughs> so a lot of the practice is not holding it too tight, but also not too loose. Finding this balance in our way of walking, in our way of breathing. People reported to us in the past when we'd have retreats that the, 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 our friends who are in the order of interbeing, they wear a, a, a brown jacket like this. Somebody said they're like the Dhamma police. They're always telling me what to do in the retreat, like to walk more mindfully or be more quiet. And so they came to the monks and nuns and they say, please, uh, can you talk to the... <laughs> so sometimes we, you know, even we could be a, a practitioner for many years, we hold too tight 
to the form of the practice. So it means we need to loosen up a little bit. Tai always reminded us that there's nothing, nothing higher than brotherhood and sisterhood. Not even the, if, if, if Buddhism gets in the way of brotherhood and sisterhood, then we need to let go of Buddhism. <laughs> so we, and, and I have often uh, tripped myself in that area where I felt like the community needs to be more formal in the practice. <laughs> and that hurt my relationship with my brothers and sisters. So I learned the hard way and I continue to learn like how to find the balance, how to tune the string just to the correct tone. And I do it by listening to my brothers, to my sisters. When I say something or do something and it makes them suffer, then I, I really listen deeply. And I say, okay, how can I adjust? And they turn down the peg a little bit <laughs> so I can tune it better. I used to just feel like, oh, what's the use? I, I, you know, you can fall into an extreme of thinking, oh, I'm, I'm really a lousy practitioner, not a very good monk, and we can fall in the other extreme of uh, other times and feel like, I am the best. You know, I'm such a good Dharma teacher. I practice mindfulness so well. Right? This is kind of mania, you know, <laughs> going back and forth between these two extremes. So I always love to remember that story of uh, the musician and the Buddha's teaching on how to tune the string. So the first step of mindful breathing is breathing in and breathing out. And then the second is following the breathing as we just practice. Following the in and the out breath. This is how we develop concentration. When we hear the word concentration, we may think like, you screw up your face and you really need to focus on whatever it is you're doing. But in the Buddhist tradition, concentration is very relaxing. Yeah? We, don't put, we don't add tension to our body or our mind when we are concentrated. We learn how to be relaxed, but to maintain awareness of one uh, the object of our meditation. In this case, the breathing. Actually, when you tense your body, your body, it's a little bit like a rubber band. It wants to spring back eventually. So you push your body to do something, and then when you relax it, then it bounces back the other way. And so we go from one extreme to the other. Like we, we decide we want to eat totally vegan. We, after we come on the retreat, we want to stop... Uh, you know, getting the tub of ice cream out of the freezer and eating the entire thing, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and so we, we, we do everything properly. We come home and we're going to have a bell in the kitchen and everyone's going to practice beginning anew once a week. <laughs> and we have that kind of aspiration. But then when it doesn't work, you know, after a few weeks and everybody, you know, gets back in their normal schedule and then we go back in the other direction and then we find ourselves eating the tub of ice cream all over again and watching, uh, I don't know, the latest, uh, binging on the latest uh, Netflix special. All right, so we, we go back and forth between these things because that's the nature of our body and our mind. If we push too much in one direction, then because we don't know how to tune the string in a way that it produces a very natural and beautiful sound, so take it easy, <laughs> relax. This is the way, uh, the beauty of what our teacher has created, has built it with a community of practice. So we can take refuge in our brothers and sisters, take refuge in this practice center. We can come regularly, regularly for days of mindfulness. And then we benefit from the collective energy. That's the way to have a balanced approach. We don't just try to force ourselves into a mold. But slowly, we, it's like we, um, the, the Zen Master Guishan, that we study as novice monks and nuns, said it's like when you walk through a meadow in the early morning, 
and our sleeve is naturally saturated by the dew in the meadow. That is the, what happens when we practice in a sangha, when we're in a community. We don't have to make a great effort. We don't have to go find a hose and spray ourselves. <laughs> we just walk through the meadow and naturally the dew penetrates our sleeve. So going in the sangha, in the community, we are penetrated by the Dhamma, by the path. We, we, we know the path. We are walking with brothers and sisters. And uh, nobody's perfect, but together somehow we are in the stream of the practice. And we know the direction to go in. So that is the spirit of this uh, calligraphy of Thai. When we look around ourselves, we already see there's a path. We see it in our, our siblings, our co-practitioners. And that gives us a lot of faith. So with the children, we um, learn to cultivate five powers. And yesterday, I think the children also presented <laughs> these five powers. So I know some of the parents who are down there with us in the Okro. So I want to uh, briefly share about these powers because they are, we all have this capacity to cultivate qualities of the good qualities. And uh, we need to know that, that as a human being, we inherit the capacity to wake up because we might judge ourselves and say, I'm, I'm not worthy, or I'm not good enough. So know that in every cell of your body is a capacity to wake up. And these, uh, these, this teaching on five powers is very helpful because we already have the capacity. The Buddha taught us that we all have the faculty to develop these five powers. It's only a matter of walking the path, and we cultivate it. So the first one the children learned about is uh, faith. Shraddha in uh, Sanskrit. So it's not blind faith. It's not the kind of faith where we just believe in something. This is a faith that comes from walking on the path. When you drive to work for the first time, you don't know the way, so you put your faith in maybe Google Maps or your GPS because you know that somebody has made a road and you have some kind of, but you take it on faith because you haven't walked it yet yourself. And then you drive it one time and that gives you more confidence. You know where you might hit traffic. You know where the, stop, uh, the traffic lights are, where the stop signs are. You know where there's construction. You start to have more awareness of the difficulties that you may encounter along the path. That's the kind of faith we're talking about here. It's the faith of having walked the path, for example, of mindful breathing, experiencing joy, Experiencing the wonder of the breath, the wonder it feels to be alive in the present moment. And because you've experienced that, you've come on a retreat, you've touched the joy of mindful breathing, you have confidence. You know that I can w continue to walk on this path. When I am lost in anxiety or fear, I can come back to my breathing. My thinking slowly dies down. It's very interesting. For your thinking to happen, it needs attention. That's a requisite factor for thinking. It needs your attention. Nowadays, so many things are vying for our attention. Uh, TikTok, YouTube, <laughs> Twitter, <laughs> email, 
the, the news online, so many things that are just, all they want is just two eyeballs <laughs> looking at them. And that is, uh, that is value. You don't even need to pay anything. <laughs> you just need your attention. And so in the monastery, in the practice center, we cultivate wholesome attention, skillful attention. We attend to our breathing. And uh, we get confidence. We have faith. So we decide to shift our attention to our breathing and not give, give our attention anymore to our thinking. So again, coming back to the marker, my finger is my attention and it's on my breathing and then it's always wanting to get pulled away in some thinking about the past. When I was walking through my hometown trying to find that joy of my friends in the past when I was in high school and not finding it, that's going way, way off <laughs> into this realm of thinking and it just is not connected to reality and it just goes around and around and around and around. <laughs> So mindful breathing is, gives us a way out. You come back to the breath, the lived experience, not your phantom breath, not the ghost breath, but the real lived experience in the present moment of the breath. And then there's life. You're in the present moment. You're aware of your body. And you, get, you touch freedom. You have what we call the taste of Zen, the taste of meditation. It feels, it tastes like freedom. That's what gives you faith. You remember that taste, and so you want more. And you continue to practice to come back to your breath. Not because the monk told you to, not because, uh, even because you think society tells, it's good, tells you it's good for you, or that you advance in your career because <laughs> you're more mindful of your breath. Just because you enjoy it in the present moment. It's just like you want to be with your loved one. You want to be with your lover in the same way you want to be with your breath in every moment. It's so pleasant to just be with my breathing, to release the tension. So breathing in, breathing out, following the breath, and the third step is being aware of the body. Breathing in, I'm aware of my body. I know here at Deer Park, uh, I help with some communication from the monastery, so sometimes I I've learned in the past year to use Instagram <laughs> and uh, sometimes Twitter. <laughs> and uh, but, you know, I try to really be aware of my, my, uh, what I'm doing when I put a post of a photo. Or, or I, luckily, we have Kenley who's helping us here, a Dhamma teacher, with most of that, so I, can, I, I don't have to do too much. <laughs> I can just send him the photo. <laughs> but I, I, I know that it's so easy to forget entirely that I have a body. Scrolling through <laughs> Instagram photos or, uh, on, or posts on Twitter or the news. Yeah? We are so lost. We think the world is in there. <laughs> it's not right here. And Thai reminded us, we can forget entirely that we have a body. So the simple practice of breathing and being aware of our body reestablishes our sovereignty. We are no longer lost in this imaginary world that's in behind the screen. We are back in this lived experience as hundreds of thousands, millions of cells in our body, and they're all transmitting, communicating to us all kinds of information about the state of our body. We cannot say that this body is one thing. 
It is an aggregate of millions of human cells, bacteria, the biome, all kinds of parasites and viruses and phages. And <laughs> they're all coming together in this body, but we're not aware. Millions of cells are being born and dying in this body. And that is a wonder. This body contains the whole universe. Tai always reminded us. And the Buddha said too that within the length of this body, we can travel the entire universe. We don't need to go out of this body. So as a young man being aware of my breath, I suddenly realized the home that I was looking for is in this very body. I don't need to go out to my hometown. I don't need to find my place because the path is in the lived experience of the present moment. In this moment, I find my home here and now and I don't have any more fear. It doesn't mean that fear won't come up again because it does but I know what to do because I have a path. The path of mindful breathing, the path of mindful walking, the path of being aware of my body. And being aware of my body, I feel I can relax. I let go of the tension in my body. I relax the body. Our body is tense because we're not paying attention to it. <laughs> we, are, we are so anxious about things that we've imagined. Reading the news, you know, the situation of the climate, the government, politics, war. Although these things are not immediately threatening, our life, but they are feeding a kind of low-line anxiety which is always there in our unconsciousness. And uh, so it's a kind of nutriment, a kind of food. So the second power is we call diligence. It means, like Sister Twineem shared the other day, that we know how to recognize a pain, uh, the kind of food, the kind of nutriment that brings us suffering, that gets us caught in the endless loop. And we know how to remove our attention from that. We know also how not to when, when that, uh, that seed goes back into our unconsciousness, when it's hidden, we know how to keep it from arising again, not to feed that feeling of anxiety or fear. And we also know how to bring up seeds like mindfulness. We know how to be aware of our breath that cultivates the seed of mindfulness. And we know as well how to keep that mindfulness present for a long time, or other wholesome mental formations like compassion or understanding. So those four aspects, the painful, unpleasant mental formation, how to invite it to go back down. The second, how to keep it from manifesting. And the second, inviting the positive mental formation to come up. And the fourth, allowing it to stay a long time in mind consciousness. That is the practice of diligence that the children learned. And that practice of diligence gives us the capacity to be mindful of third power. Mindful of our body, also 
as we go deeper into mindful breathing, we become aware of our feelings, our painful feelings, and we know how to take care of those painful feelings, to not continue to feed those painful feelings. Because we, with our attention, we are feeding our difficult mental formations. So mindfulness allows us to be aware of that process of continuing to get caught in the cycle of uh, anxiety and fear and to come out, come back to the present moment, come back to this wonder of uh, the tweens coming into the Dhamma Hall. <laughs> so we have faith, diligence, mindfulness. Do any of the tweens remember? What is the fourth power? Banana, Banana that's right. <laughs> Because Sister Banana was teaching them concentration. So banana has become the word for concentration. So if concentration is too long for you, just remember, banana. <laughs> so the fourth power is concentration, which we already learned about. Learning to, in a relaxed way, to keep our attention on our breathing. And there are many kinds of concentration. Actually, this retreat is too short. <laughs> so I wish we could go into more detail about it. There's concentration on emptiness, concentration on signlessness, on wishlessness, very deep concentrations which allow our mind to pierce the veil of uh, delusion in our mind, in our imaginary thinking, and become free. But it all is just rooted in awareness of the breath. Just being aware of the impermanence of our in and out breath. And maintaining that over time. And we develop the power of concentration. And the last power Any of the tweens, what's the last power? Insight, Insight. all right. Oh, they studied very well. Insight. For example, we get the insight that we have a body. <laughs> when we are lost in our thinking, we forget we have a body, but with Mindfulness and concentration, we remember we have a body. We are breathing in and out. This is a very deep insight, actually. And that insight can go even deeper. We see that this body is impermanent. And we are no longer obsessed about our body, the way our body looks, that our body is getting old. We don't fear. That's the nature of the body, to get old to start to break down, to get sick, to die. That's what a body does. What, it would be strange if a body didn't do those things. <laughs> right? When do you think it's very strange? I remember when we, in, here in San Diego, years ago, the artists who had taken whole like nervous systems and like capillary system and they plastify it. It's so strange, right? It's like parts of the body and they become like they inject plastic so you can see it. What was it called? The human body or something like that? Yeah. Anyway, I remember thinking like, right, this is a, trying to make what is impermanent, permanent. <laughs> I mean, it's a form of art. But imagine if the body didn't grow old and die. It's so strange. We would... If we were, if it were not for impermanence as a young boy, we would just stay as a young boy all the time. We could not grow up into a, 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 a man. So we learn to appreciate impermanence. That's a deep insight that we get with the practice. We learn to accept that our body is of the nature to grow old, to die, 
And that doesn't, we don't have fear. In fact, we feel less fear with that insight. We feel more free. So I hope that uh, as we go home from this retreat, um, we can continue to cultivate these five powers yeah, because we have a path and we no longer have fear when we're on the path. And having faith, having the practice of a diligent practice, mindfulness, coming back to our body, maintaining that awareness over time, we get the deep insight into the nature of things. And then we don't need to, we don't uh, uh, worry about the meaning of life. <laughs> because the meaning of life is right here, right now, in every moment. I taught us many times, if you want to know what happens after death, you have to ask yourself, do you know what's going on right now? <laughs> because if you know what's going on right now, which is birth and death, we are constantly being born and dying every moment. I'm not the same person who started giving this Dhamma talk. You see, this change is always going on, always happening. Cells are constantly being born and dying. Thoughts, impressions, emotions are, are manifesting and then hiding themselves over again. And with mindfulness, we become aware of that. So we don't have fear about what happens after death. We see that birth and death are going on in this body right now. And we learn to expand our capacity to be aware of that, to be aware of what's going on in the present moment. That's a deep insight into the nature of reality. We pierce the veil of reality and touch the unconditioned. So I hope that you uh, continue to practice, that we continue to bring our families back here. I wish that we can have a longer retreat next time because you know, four days is not enough for a retreat. Um, we want to uh, learn and grow here at Deer Park. <laughs> we are a growing monastic Sangha. We have young monks and nuns who are training, or young aspirants, young men and women who want to become monks and nuns. And uh, so this, please help us to build this beautiful community here. Come back and help us to grow. So um, maybe we can invite the children up here in the tweens. Please come up, everyone. We can, uh, we have a, a song we like to sing to uh, celebrate our togetherness and overcome our fear of uh, <laughs> having to leave each other. You know, we have the idea that we, we, we want to leave that we, we have to leave the retreat and that we, somehow we're, we're, we're going to leave each other. So maybe we could, uh, all of us, we can also stand up with the children. And we can um, sing the song, No Coming, No Going. Did you guys learn the song, No Coming, No Going yet? No? Okay. Well, well, we'll sing along a few times. We can hold hands. So this is uh, this family, this community that we've, we've uh, built here. Please come and join hands with the children. We can. And uh, just be aware of this togetherness that we have here, that we've um, cultivated together as a community. We can sing this song, uh, No Coming, No Going. <laughs> no coming, no going. No after, no before. I hold you close to me. I release you to be so free, 
Because I am in you, and you are in me. Because I am in you, and you are in me. Maybe in Vietnamese? Kong di do kung kong kan he kong chu kung kong song Maybe we can invite the organizing team to come up. To can uh, I don't know if they are here for the closing circle. Suko Tui Tien is invited to come up, and the other organizers. Okay. Maybe we can uh, kind of come to the side and join hands to have a closing circle and uh, offer our thanks and gratitude for all of those who've contributed to the retreat. The organizing team are actually cooking for us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Tin? No, Tin Gim is right here. Tin Gim, come up here. Nyang, Men Nyang. So dear Tay, dear community, aware that we have a path, Ga Dung, aware that we have Sangha, Ga Dai Chung. Let's form a beautiful circle. A circle where we can see each other as best as we can. A circle where we remember that this is special and not everyone has the privilege to be able to stand like we stand at this moment. Feeling arrival day, feeling when we set up our tents, we arrived in the dorms, maybe the first meal we had, that was my cooking team. <laughs> aware of the children in the circle garden, aware of the sangha in the mountain. And let's just stand together and just see and marvel that there's no guarantee we'll get a day like this in the near future, but at least now we have this moment. And with that awareness of where we are and where our constellation of family is right now, also aware that lunch is in five short minutes, <laughs> maybe we can share from our heart a few sharings. It doesn't have to be too long. It can be nice and sweet. Maybe something that made you grateful, something that you enjoyed about your time here. And to expedite that, I can walk and hand a microphone. Brother Peace on the other end has a microphone. So you please share maybe a moment that touched you, a moment you'll take home for a while still, so that we can continue to nourish ourselves here and when we go our separate ways. Thank you.